It's been five years since the first time I ever took my first dose of psilocybin psychedelic mushrooms and my, my life has, I don't know what my life would be like if I had never taken them. So I'm going to break this down into three themes of transformation and one of the recurring things that I might say more than a few times is that this, I cannot explain it linearly. It's not a linear thing. In fact, what shrooms did to me, and the first time I took them, I took two grams, but I had a full-blown mystical experience. And I would describe it as the top two or three most meaningful and most memorable experiences of my life. It was like that profound. And I remember just riding through an, a roller coaster of the human experience. You know, everything that my spirit could feel, I felt from bliss and joy to peace to, to crying. To sobbing, you know, tears of happiness to tears of sadness. There's the whole experience flowed through me in those eight hours. And by the time I, I got out of it, it felt like I just went through like half a lifetime, if not multiple lifetimes of wisdom and emotional experience in those, in that eight hour window. So a lot of the times I know it's like the psychedelic experience really is ineffable, but I will do my best to break them down into categories and dissect them. So the first theme of transformation is who am I? You know, prior to doing the mushrooms for the first time, I thought I knew who I was. I thought my identity was my age. I thought it was my race. I thought it was my sex. I thought it was what school I went to. I thought it was how much money I made. I thought it was who my family was. I thought it was where I lived. I remember staring at myself in the mirror on that first trip. And I just stared blankly. I looked at that person in the mirror and I asked myself, you know, I was like, who are you? And I realized, it was like, I don't know who I am. Like, who, who is this? Who is this character? And it really brought to life the fact for me, for the very first time, this, this, it was like a, what do you call it? D disassociation? Would you call it that? I disassociated from my identity and from reality as I knew it. You know, it was like on that trip, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what anything was anymore. You know, I had no preconceived notion, no conditioning. All the conditioning dropped away from what I thought I knew about who I was in relation to what all of this is and what reality is. And it was like a mental explosion, you know, my complete circuit for how I could conceive the world was fried. And I felt this sense of supreme emptiness. Like everything was empty. Like there lacked an inherent meaning in things. Now I know when I say that, you want to jump to this conclusion. And I, I, I jumped to this conclusion too prior to that experience that meaninglessness is depressing. But it was a different kind of emptiness. It was an emptiness where I felt like I was free. You know, it felt like nothing mattered. 
nothing was real. You know, it's, it was like, this is all made up, you know. And, you know, in the Hindu scriptures and the ancient scriptures, they talk about the million masks of God, the, the world as a play, as a drama. And it was like seeing through that illusion of being identified with who I thought I was to realize that this entire thing is source. It is part of the play and we're all playing characters of who we think we are, but it's a fragile little identity and it causes us great suffering when we mistake our identity for it. This brings us to the second theme and that's the question of why am I here? So by now you might be beginning to notice that these questions, you know, who am I? Why am I here? You can't separate them really. You can't categorize them as separate things because they are fundamentally part of the same blend, the same sauce, you know what I mean? Earlier we talked about this emptiness, nothing mattering, but it wasn't like nothing mattering in a depressing way that I would have conceived in the past, but it was an emptiness in the sense of like, I'm totally free. I'm free. There's nothing I have to be, nothing I have to do, nothing I have to achieve. I'm as I am, and I'm liberated in my soul, in my spirit, as the very being, as the very spirit that I am, because I'm eternal. And my body, you know, my life, who I think I am, all of this only manifests through that eternal source that animates my existence. It's very hard to talk about this because it sounds very woo-woo if, you know, you've never had a experience with it. In the same way that you feel, I felt, that nothing is real. Nothing is what I, what I thought it was. Nothing is, it's only my perception that makes it seem like what it is and that there is no inherent meaning to anything but the meaning that we give it. So came this realization that every boundary is literally just an imaginary box. In other words, these boundaries that we make up are not real. Now, what I mean by boundaries, you might call it the matrix, you might call it social, social convention, you might call it culture. In essence, it's, it's the implicit rules that we, whether individually or as a society, give to any particular thing. You know, it's like we put up this imaginary boundary of life is just a path through this set road. Right. This is the most cliche example I can give, but you, you know, you grow up, you go to school. Okay. You take your exams, you get into a good school, you get good grades, you get a respectable job. You work that job until retirement until 65 and then you retire and then your life is supposed to, I don't know be what it is. <laughs> That's the most, one of the most implicit boxes that we trap ourselves in without even knowing it, right? We think life is confined within these limitations of what we can do and we dare not step outside of it because to most people, it's not even conceivable that there is a possibility of stepping outside of it. I'll give another analogy. I saw a, a short video and it was this man who raised lions from when they were cubs. And this man would use his sandal whenever the lions misbehaved 
Smack him, smack him, smack him. Man slapped the lion's paw and scolded it for damaging the car mat. The lion wanted to resist, but was afraid of the man's sandal, as it had been disciplined by it since it was young. Biting the man's hand resulted in a sandal beating, and making noise to interrupt the man would also get the sandal treatment. When a group of lions were fighting, they became alert as the man approached. As soon as he took off his sandal, the lions scattered in. These are lions. It's the fact that even lions can be so conditioned to not realize that they're lions and they could tear this guy apart in three seconds. But instead, their imagination has been so conditioned to be boxed into these, this boundary of the sandal is scary that they cower and they're never courageous enough to realize that they're lions. Now, hopefully that analogy is self-explanatory. With that realization that everything, every kind of boundary is kind of like an imaginary little box that we trap ourselves in and we're imprisoned by it and we don't even know it. it, is also the realization that everything is a game. In other words, boundaries are imagined. And, you know, you think about it, what is basketball? What is soccer? What is tennis? What is hockey? Any sport you can imagine. Let's just take basketball, for example. It's a game. It's literally a game with arbitrary rules and arbitrary boundaries. And you have to respect those boundaries in order to play the game, right? When you view it from a purely like unattached perspective, what is it? You have a bouncy ball, you bounce it around, you shoot it in the hoop. And then there's all of, all of these rules created around it. But the point is that it's completely arbitrary. You know, why does the ball have to be how big it is? Why does the hoop have to be how tall it is? Why does the court have to be how big it is? Why is, why is a game set to this amount of time? Why are there four quarters? Why is it when you score outside of the, the, the ring, I don't know, I forgot, the three-pointer line, it's three points, and inside it's two points, right? All of these decisions are arbitrary. And you realize that all these sports, all these games that we're playing, whether it's the job application process, it's the government, it's bureaucracy, it's, you know, the fact that we have to pay taxes, it's the fact that there's 12 grades. All of these are arbitrary in the sense that they were created out of an idea, out of thin air. And because everybody accepts it, we just deem it as this is what it is and it's a rule without realizing that it is a socially agreed upon imaginary box. And we, when we don't realize this, we get stuck in its boundary without realizing we're imprisoned within it and we don't realize we can break free. The third theme of the transformation, what is this? We've talked about the fact that everything is an imaginary box. Nothing matters. Nothing is real. The realization that everything is a game, everything is imaginary, everything is arbitrary in its own sense, led to the realization that creativity is accessible to everyone. Now I'm referring to creativity not in the conventional way that you know, the, the, the mainstream definition of creativity is, you know, you have to be an artist in some manner, whether that's music, visual art, um, or writing, whatever, right? 
But I mean creativity in the sense of you are the creator. You are the creator of your own life. And it's actually quite astonishing to how little of a degree we actually we realize this. All creativity means is that you have the power to create and design your life. You know, how do you want your body to look? What kind of work do you want to be doing? What kind of hobbies do you like to enjoy? Who do you want to be? How do you want to conduct yourself? What kind of relationships do you want? It's so easy to get caught up in the external world that we become distracted from our own power. We blame circumstances, you know. Oh, I'm not rich because blah, 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 blah. I'm not fit because blah, 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 blah. Right? We, it's easy to be victims to our lives when we don't realize we have power over it. And power to a degree that your freedom doesn't come from the shiny toys. It doesn't come from the amount of money. It doesn't come from anything external from you. Your freedom you create within you. And all the money in the world is meaningless without that internal freedom. Now, I'm not saying to renounce materiality. That's a very easy conclusion to come to if you come to a realization that, you know, you find peace within, you know, freedom is within, the whole spiritual thing, right? I think the ultimate beauty of life is to realize that all of these things are illusions. But don't kid yourself because pleasure is still pleasure, right? A nice car is still a nice car. You can enjoy it. Just don't be fooled by its appearance. I believe that true abundance and wealth comes to those who know that the material things they get are only a byproduct of who they are and how they conduct themselves. So fundamentally, this in here has to be too in tune with that frequency of prosperity in order for the outside to show up as a byproduct. Like I said in the beginning, uh, this explanation, if you will, probably feels all over the place. And I, I can't help it. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's not something that is very linear. It's kind of just all, you know, it's kind of just blended together. And when you see the connections, it just makes perfect sense. The last thing I want to say is that what shifted in me, one of the qualities, one of the most fundamental qualities in me, Number one is before the trip, I would see life in good or bad, light or dark, tall or short, in duality, in opposites, right or wrong. That's a big one. What do you think wars are fought over? People kill each other because they think they're right. How it's changed me is seeing how polar opposites are actually one. So th this is the whole essence of, of Taoist teaching, right? Um, the yin and the yang symbol, right? One is black, one is white. But the mistake we make of conceiving what the world is is that right and wrong are in a constant battle, life and death, you know, and this puts us in a great anxiety. And I would argue a sense of schizophrenia, a, a spiritual schizophrenia. We don't see how yin and yang flow together in harmony. And that's what creates reality. Alan Watts says it best, you know, if there was no darkness, the light couldn't shine. 
How could the light shine if there was no darkness to contrast it? How could you know what happiness is unless you could also experience what sadness is? How could you know that life is, there is life if there is no death? You need the contrast to appreciate it. I'll give you the most concrete example. Let's say I have a nice steam shower at home. I go on a nice 50 kilometer run. I'm sweating. I'm tired. I'm drained. I step into that sauna. Oh my gosh. Bliss. Heaven. You need to understand pain in order to understand pleasure. I fast for two days. I'm suffering from hunger. I see a big bucket of fried chicken in front of me. I take a bite. Mm. Right? You can't appreciate the pleasure unless you've experienced the pain. We are so removed from the pain in a lot of daily life that we don't realize how blessed we are. As something as simple as a toilet. The fact that you have plumbing and a toilet at home. You don't even think about that. Unless it's taken away from you. Now you have a big problem, right? But <clears throat> that's the first quality. Is this going from duality to unity. The second quality is seeing life from a very quantitative perspective into seeing it from a qualitative perspective. In, in other words, this ties back to what I was talking about earlier. This obsession, this illusion that we fall into of chasing status symbols, of putting nice sounding words on a resume, big hefty stats and percentages and dollar symbols, dollar signs to try to impress people. It's going from that into realizing that it's empty there. It's like a vanity. The number, it's what you feel about the number. It's your pride in that. It's your attachment to that number. But ultimately, the number is meaningless. We make this mistake of mistaking symbols for reality. And you realize that it's not a quantity you want, right? It's not about how many cars you have. It's not about how much square foot your house is. You know, you can flex that and you can get a 10 second hit of dopamine. Oh yeah, I have a 10,000 square foot house. Oh yeah, I own nine cars. You know, you feel really good about it. Ooh. Like, yeah, I have nine cars. You feel really good about it for about 10 seconds. Yeah, I make 500,000 a year. But when you get over that illusion, you realize that it's not the quantity you're after. It's the quality, you know, the quality of your life. How do you actually feel day to day? You know, what qualities dominate in your life, right? The quantities could matter less if you're still miserable. And being miserable is a quality. If you're still here, thank you for being here. If this content resonated with you, like the video, subscribe. It really helps me out a lot. Let me know what your experiences has, have been with psychedelics, what realizations, even without psychedelics, right? What kind of realizations have you made about life that, you know, you, you find it's hard to share with other people because you might sound crazy. Uh, I would love to hear your, your thoughts on your take on life and what you think about it in your own way. I uh, went on a three-day solo backpacking trip 
And uh, it's about an hour of just nice solitude and getting away from the noise, if you will. So if you're interested in that, video will be up here. Uh, other than that, see you in the next one.